Japan, that lovely little island where Hello Kitty is a national treasure and politeness is practiced with the fervor of a religious ritual. It also happens to be the birthplace of a criminal enterprise so vast and disciplined it would make Al Capone blush. Enter the Yakuza. Now, the Yakuza are not your run-of-the-mill thugs. They are more like modern-day samurai, minus the Bushido code with a dash of corporate ambition. The Yakuza has existed since the 17th century. They were people on the fringes, gamblers, hawkers, petty criminals, the outcasts of society. The word Yakuza means a worthless hand in a traditional Japanese card game, something that can help you understand how the Yakuza see the world. You know what they say, when life gives you lemons, go ahead and form a criminal syndicate and make yourself billions and billions of dollars, or something like that. As Japan was transformed from a feudal society to an industrial one, so too were the Yakuza. They formed themselves into sophisticated rankings that would impress any general of an army. But the structure kind of mirrored the structure of a family. At the very top is the Oyabun, or father, the boss man who makes the rules. Just beneath him are the loyal Koban, or children, who will cut off their pinkies as a measure of loyalty, which they do. This delightful custom is called Yubitsume, and it's the sort of custom that can really wreck your piano lessons. These guys are more than petty gangs, they're international businessmen, and the Yamaguchi Gumi are the largest of them all. They are responsible for almost 50% of the total Yakuza activities in Japan, and they earn billions every year. How, you might ask? Well, when they're not busy with finger mutilation or getting their bodies completely tattooed, they're involved in other business activities like selling drugs and arms as well as earning from the stock market. You know, just like any other aspiring entrepreneur. Criminality notwithstanding, the Yakuza have managed to penetrate Japanese society at nearly every level. Sure, they strike fear in people, but they're also respected. They have a moral code that may be twisted, but it's also viewed as fair by a lot of people. They are several centuries old, and it's clear they're here to stay, much to the chagrin of people who would prefer their societies a bit less bloody. The Yakuza are a very busy group. A typical gang might be happy to limit itself to dealing drugs and extorting people, but the Yakuza go way beyond that. They're deeply embedded in Japan's economy. With fingers in so many pies, it's no wonder the Koban cut them off so willingly. The Yamaguchi Gumi, the largest of the Yakuza clans, is also the most diversified. They have ownership stakes in the construction business, in real estate, and even investment in the stock exchange. Yeah, you heard me right. The Yakuza plays in the stock exchange. They have a massive financial empire, pulling in about $80 billion a year. The Yakuza have basically perfected the art of corporate theft. They're able to manipulate markets, circumvent regulations, and get their hands on government contracts in many different sectors. They've also managed to control a huge portion of Japan's adult entertainment industry. Now, way back in 1907, Japan made it illegal to, um, show the naughty bits, let's say. Any legal adult film will have these parts blurred out or blacked out. But there's big, big money to be made in selling content without this censorship. It's illegal, of course, but the Yakuza don't care. Real estate was one of the Yakuza's first big white-collar grabs. In the 1980s, they began sending their enforcers off to work for real estate agents. They called these guys the Jigaya. Basically, real estate agents would hire a Japanese gangster when they wanted to demolish a residential area and put in a new development, but couldn't get some landowner to leave. The Jigaya's job was to cut them out. They throw stuff in their mailboxes, scrawl obscene words on their walls. In one case, the Yakuza emptied the foul contents of an entire septic tank into someone's window. Whatever it took to get someone to sell, the Yakuza would do it. They did the dirty work and the government just let them do it. Then there's construction. Japan is a notoriously earthquake and tsunami prone country. And anytime the earth shakes, the Yakuza are there to help rebuild. After the 1995 Kobe earthquake, the Yakuza were some of the first responders. It was the same after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Both disasters were catastrophic, but the Yakuza stepped in and did a lot of good. They sent trucks filled with food and blankets and water and medical supplies. After the 2011 tsunami, they sent over half a million dollars worth of relief supplies to the hardest hit areas. Now at face value, this seems like a noble act. But dig a little deeper and you realize that this charity helps them get in nice with the politicians and businessmen involved in a rebuilding effort. And there's a lot of money to be made in a rebuilding effort. It's also an image thing. Charity like this can make the Yakuza look like protectors instead of predators, which is good PR. The Yakuza are also in the business of maintaining peace, at least their kind of peace. They've established what are basically protection rackets that look a whole lot like private security services. But if you don't pay up, they might burn down your business. That's a great business model. Despite their criminal nature, the Yakuza are tolerated by many in Japan probably because they've been around so long that people don't know what life without them would look like. 
They operate openly with known headquarters and even official websites. Because why not? If you're going to run a criminal enterprise, you might as well do it with a bit of style. Now, we mentioned the Yakuza's role in relief efforts after earthquakes and tsunamis hit and devastated large parts of Japan. But let's talk more about that. The cynical side of you may think that the Yakuza are involved in these charity efforts mostly to bolster their reputation as protectors and get on the good side of politicians and businessmen and then worm their way into the lucrative construction contracts. Now that's true, but there's also the fact that the Yakuza have a history of being outsiders. Many of them are social castaways who have faced discrimination and come from minority populations like ethnic Koreans or Barakaman people who work as butchers and leather tanners, professions that are connected to death in Japanese society and often looked down on. The Yakuza's link to Japanese politics is a wild story that starts decades ago in the wake of the Second World War. During the post-war period, Japan was shattered and as the nation sought to rebuild, some pretty shady figures infiltrated the leadership. It was during this period, too, that the Yakuza went pretty hard right, turning to extreme nationalist ideologies and links to ultra-right organizations, a stance that bled into the political scene. One of the most notable actors in all this was a guy named Yoshio Kodama, a former war criminal who eventually established himself in Japan's Yakuza circles. He and his co-conspirator, Ryoichi Sasakawa, who ended up building a speedboat empire and becoming one of the richest men in the world, helped establish the Liberal Democratic Party, or the LDP, which has basically dominated Japanese politics ever since. These guys weren't out in the open. They were the puppet masters behind the scenes, quietly pulling the strings. In fact, Kodama was also instrumental in bringing into existence the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty of 1960 enlisting the services of Yakuza thugs to ensure that leftist demonstrators did not disrupt proceedings. Their influence went straight to the top. Nobusuke Kishi, a former prime minister and also the grandfather of Shinzo Abe, had strong ties with the Yakuza through Kodoma and Sasakawa. It was a partnership that ensured politics in Japan remained conservative and anti-communist. For this, the Yakuza were provided with the political shield they needed to grow their criminal enterprise. But in the 1970s, things started heading south. The Lockheed bribery scandal blew up when it came out that Kodama had been lobbying on behalf of the American aircraft company, greasing the palms of Japanese politicians, including Prime Minister Kakuwe Tanaka. The whole thing led to public outrage and forced the government to start distancing itself from the Yakuza. But the Yakuza were still the Yakuza, and they still had political power even though it was less obvious. But in 2022, former Prime Minister Shinzo was shot dead. His killer was a guy named Tetsuya Yamagami, he said he shot Abe because his mother had gone broke donating nearly a million dollars to the Unification Church. Now here's where things get even juicier. The Unification Church was founded by a guy named Sung Myung Moon in South Korea. 1958, the church established a branch in Japan, and a few years later, none other than Ryoichi Sasakawa, Kodama's partner and speedboat mogul, became an official advisor to the church. The Unification Church is controversial at best and downright evil at worst. It practices mass wedding ceremonies where thousands of couples, often strangers, are married in large groups. But what really earned the church its shady reputation were its aggressive fundraising tactics and the manipulation of its followers, who were often coerced into donating large sums of money. The church also engaged in a practice known as Reikon Shoho, or psychic marketing, where members are convinced that buying overpriced religious items like vases or beads will protect their families from curses or ensure their deceased relatives' peace in the afterlife. Now, because of that, Sung Myung Moon became a billionaire. While their followers were left so broke that they end up assassinating a former president because of their connections to the church and the Yakuza. It's like an unholy trinity of church, triad, and politician. Finally, let's talk about ritual and honor. The Yakuza aren't just thugs. They're thugs with a distinct culture. They have traditions and customs that are vital to their way of life. Tattoos are maybe the most well-known aspect of Yakuza culture. They have a lot of them. They're often full-body mosaics a gang member will add on to over the course of a lifetime. Now, these tattoos called a resume usually tell a story steeped in symbolism. The koi fish, for example, is a symbol of strength. Dragons represent power. Cherry blossoms are a reminder of how transient life is, especially if you make a member of the Yakuza mad. Traditional Yakuza tattoos are intricate and done using an old-school method, a stick with a needle attached to it, dipped in ink and shoved into the skin manually. It's a long and agonizing journey. An initiation, basically. It's also a great way of ensuring that you never, ever get a desk job. Then there's the yubitsume. Yubitsume is a pretty extreme way of saying I'm sorry in the Yakuza. When you're with the Yakuza and you make a mistake, you don't just face some slight disciplinary action. 
you're not going to get written up. Sometimes you have to physically cut off your own finger. Said cut off is then presented to the boss as an apology for whatever wrong you did and in hopes of being forgiven. The Yakuza also have their own code of conduct called Ninkyo, which is based on loyalty, reverence, and bravery. Now this code is often likened to the Bushido code that the samurai would observe, only this one has a more sinister element to it. Where Bushido was honorable and ethical, the Yakuza's Ninkyo code is, well, a little more morally ambiguous. Despite their efforts to modernize, some Yakuza groups even have websites now. The rituals and codes remain a vital part of their identity. It's what keeps them together in a world that's constantly changing, and it's what makes them such a unique if terrifying part of Japanese culture. Hey, thanks for watching. What other societies organized crime culture would you like to learn about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe and share this video with a friend and all that good stuff to stay up to date on all the nutty stories from human history.